Mr. President, I was pleased to see on the front page of the Washington Post that President-elect Trump was speaking about how we should maintain at least the number of people covered under Obamacare in a new kind of replacement for that portion of Obamacare. And if you will, I agree totally with him. We should fulfill this promise and do it, as he said, at a lower cost. And we think we have a mechanism to do so, and with Senator Collins, we'll speak to that today. First, let me just point out, for those that are praising Obamacare, I will say that since it's passed, the American people have been voting consistently against candidates who supported Obamacare, culminating in the election of President-elect Trump. So whatever folks might say about how wonderful it is, the American people are voting against it consistently. Now that said, there is a mandate from the American people not just to repeal, but to replace. So it isn't that the American people don't want uh, to have coverage, and they don't want folks with pre-existing conditions to have their issues addressed, but what they are concerned about is the way that Obamacare was forced upon them with the power of Washington, D.C., reaching into their own life, if you will, to their kitchen table, promising them penalties unless they complied with the Washington bureaucrats' directive. That is what the American people do not like. So first, can we maintain coverage? President-elect Trump said we are going to have insurance for everybody. Two, will we cover more? Yes. And three, can we lower costs? The answer there is yes. Now, let's first speak to covering more Americans than Obamacare. Both President-elect Trump, Majority Leader McConnell, Speaker Ryan have all committed to maintaining coverage for all. Now, people speak of the advances made under Obamacare. I will give them those advances. And there's still 30 million people uninsured. Our, our alternative has the potential to cover 95% of Americans without a mandate. The way we do this is that as we return power to the states, we give states the option of saying that everyone, who's in, who, everyone who is eligible for coverage is enrolled unless they choose not to be. Just like when I turn 65 and I'm on Medicare. I'm on Medicare, I don't feel like I'm a mandate, no one calls me up. Indeed, if I don't want to be on Medicare, I have to call somebody up and tell them I don't want to be on. State legislatures would have the option to say you're in unless you call and tell us that you're out. I say that addresses two folks who are hard to reach. The fellow whose life is so in disarray he's living beneath a uh, park bench, and the typical 28-year-old male uh, who never thinks about health insurance, and all of a sudden he's in without even realizing that he's in, until he needs it, and then he'll be very pleased. But on the other hand, if you don't want to be in, we make it easy to get out. Um, um, and by the way, I speak of that fellow living beneath the park bench, uh, Mr. President, as a physician who's worked in a hospital for the uninsured for 30 years, that is not a tongue-in-cheek, and that is not a throwaway line. That person living beneath the park bench will never have his life well enough together, or almost never, to go to a public library, to log on to healthcare.gov. He doesn't have a W-2, and if he did, he lost it long ago, to submit it to sign up. Under our program, he is enrolled. Now, what is the benefit that we would get? He would have a health savings account, so that if he goes to the urgent care center with a nail in his foot, it is covered. He has a pharmacy benefit, so that if he gets his life together while he's at that urgent care center to take an antipsychotic, he has a pharmacy benefit. And lastly, if something terrible happens, he's hit by a car or something, then he's brought to the hospital, and that catastrophic coverage protects society against the cost of his, of his uh, hospitalization. Now, by the way, under our plan, we give states the power, and I would like to think that this is something that Democrats and Republicans can agree to. If you, when Republicans say, you can keep your plan if you like it and we mean it, we mean it. The way we would do this is that Congress would give state alternative options. The state would have the choice. The state could go with the alternative, which we will lay out. The state could opt for nothing, no Medicaid expansion and no help for their lower income folks. Or the state could opt to stay in Obamacare. If Illinois, California, Massachusetts, New York wants to stay in Obamacare, we think they should have the right to stay in Obamacare. Obamacare, if it's working for your state, God bless you. On the other hand, it's not working for a state where there are double-digit and sometimes triple-digit premium increases in one year. So the state could choose, 
to stay in Obamacare for nothing or for the alternative which we um, um, lay out for them. By the way, I would say that those that govern closest to those who are governed, govern best. We know that the state of Alaska is far different than the state of California, Illinois, Louisiana, or New York. So let those states decide the system that works best for them. What's the timeline? Twenty seventeen, this year we would like to repeal Obamacare, but put in place the legislation which allows in twenty eighteen for a state legislature or a governor to choose the option which they wish and the method by which they, they wish to enroll their, uh, the people of their state. In 2019, the state would implement the replace option of their choice, and by 2020, the uh, repeal and the replace would have been uh, finished. If at a later date, a state wishes to change their option, they decided to stay with Obamacare, but on second thought, now they wish to have the alternative we lay out, which I actually think that would be something that might happen, they could choose that at a later option. We are not being partisan. I tell folks this is not a Republican plan, not a Democratic plan. It's, it's a patient plan. Born out of my experience working in a public hospital for the uninsured, that if you give the patient the power, things line up. And if we can make it an American patient plan, it doesn't matter what your state decides. I'm, I am comfortable that we'll end up in the right place. Um, um, Mr. President, our goal is to fulfill President-elect Trump's promise, more coverage at lower cost. We think that we have laid out a pathway which can truly be bipartisan uh, to achieve that goal. And with that, I yield uh, back. Mr. President. Senator from Maine. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, first let me start by commending the senator from Louisiana for all of the thought and the work that he has put into coming up with an alternative plan that would fix Obamacare and result in more Americans having affordable health insurance. As a physician, Senator Cassidy cares deeply about his patients and about patients in general. And his goal, which I share, is to make sure that every American has access to affordable health care. And I commend him for his hard work and leadership. Mr. President, there's been much debate lately on the best approach to replacing and reforming the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. Now, some of my colleagues have argued for immediate repeal without any replacement, an option that I reject for risks leaving millions of vulnerable Americans without affordable health insurance and would undo important consumer protections provided by current law. Others have proposed repeal with a delayed effective date of two or three years to allow time for the Senate to devise legislation that would provide a better approach to health insurance. My concern with the repeal and delay plan is that the Obamacare exchanges already on very shaky financial grounds would go into a death spiral as consumers would face uncertainty and insurers would have no basis for pricing their policies. Already we have seen insurers fleeing the marketplaces in many states reducing choices for consumers. In some states, only one or two insurers remain on the exchanges, leaving individuals with, and families with few, if any, choice of insurance carriers. Every single one of the 23 cooperatives whose startup costs were financed by Obamacare has experienced severe financial problems 
and only five remain operational today. Many states, including Maine, are experiencing double-digit increases in premiums, causing increased costs for consumers and for taxpayers. So repeal and delay would only exacerbate this problem. Mr. President, I'm pleased to see a growing consensus among members of both the Senate and the House that we must fix Obamacare, provide reforms at nearly the same time that we repealed the law in order to protect families who rely on the program and to give insurers time to transition to a new marketplace that is based on more choices for consumers. Now, many of us have been working for years on proposals to reform our health care system, to expand coverage, and to encourage new delivery systems that would help restrain the growth in health care costs. And that is what the legislation that I'm going to be pleased to be joining my colleague from Louisiana would do. It's focused on giving more choices while ensuring that consumers have access to affordable health insurance. We've advanced bipartisan proposals in the past to deal with provisions of the law that have increased costs and discouraged employers from hiring full-time workers. Regrettably, every such reform has been met with a veto threat. And that is why we've continued to work. In 2015, I joined Senator Cassidy in introducing a more comprehensive and creative approach, the Patient Freedom Act. This would allow, and it's the basis for the legislation we're going to be introducing soon, it would allow states to have more choices. If they like the Affordable Care Act, they can keep the Affordable Care Act. If they want to go an alternative route that is more patient-centered, that would provide more choices and help to restrain costs, they can do that too. And the federal government would bundle the funding that would otherwise be used for the ACA subsidies and uh, expansion of Medicaid in their state and allow them to proceed along a more creative route. We recognize how different the needs of our states are, but our citizens should have access to affordable health care and to choose the path that works best for them. We'll be talking more about the specifics of our bill when we introduce it. But I'm excited about this approach. I'm not saying that it's perfect, but it's important that we put specific proposals on the table that our colleagues can coalesce around, debate, and refine so that we can move ahead and remove the fear and uncertainty of families who are relying on coverage through the exchanges, without putting an undue burden on the employers who create jobs in this country. Mr. President, let me again commend the senator from Louisiana. He has worked so hard to come up with a fresh approach. He's been very open to suggestions that I and others have made. We all understand the importance of maintaining the consumer protections that help individuals with pre-existing conditions, that ensure that young people can remain on their parents' uh, insurance policies until age 26, that prohibit lifetime caps. Those provisions would remain. But what we want to do is to allow our states the option of selecting a different path that will lead to patient-directed reforms that contain costs 
and provide citizens with more health care choices. The Patient Freedom Act does just that. And again, I want to commend my colleague, Senator Cassidy, for his leadership. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.